it's it's funny because I wrote for and about men for uh, like a solid decade. That's pretty much all I did. I think I had to work through some issues. <laughs> um, and also fearful always of my own vulnerabilities. I think I was intrinsically attracted to like flinty macho people um, I, wanting to be like that um, because it's not at all how I am. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of magnet, magnetized toward people like that. And, and I was interested in them. And, you know, I wrote for Spin for years and I wrote for GQ for years. They're both really male-focused magazines. And, you know, I wrote a book called The Last American Man that was this big study of a woodsman. And then my novel Stern Men was about a girl, but it was a girl in a very manly world um, who behaved in a very manly manner um, and, and who was herself sort of tough and macho and flinty. Um, and, and then after really a solid decade of doing nothing but kind of exhaustively examining masculinity from every possible angle, to the point that I even did a story for GQ once where I became a man for a week, like really, like inhabiting it in this really intense and direct way. Um, you know, my life fell apart, and I and I wrote my way through it with Eat, Pray, Love, and then the book came. This became this big phenomenon, and suddenly I started hearing myself referred to as a chick lit author, which was was really strange after a decade of like really putting in the hours to write about men and 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 think about men and and. Back in my 20s, I, people used to say that I wrote like a man, which I took as a compliment. And now um, I'm often referred to as a chick lit writer, which I, I am not even completely certain I know what that means, except that I'm pretty certain it is never intended as a compliment. <laughs> you know, and I, I think it's strange. I think it's it's curious, this whole idea of like gender based writing. And, and I also have to, I have to say the whole chick lit thing bugs me because, you know, in our culture at this moment in time, it is women who read, and pretty much exclusively it is women who read. And, and there's this kind of denigration of, of women's reading, which um, is a pity because they're the ones holding that whole custom up right now. Um, so it's odd. And, uh, and my next book, which is a, a memoir and a kind of meditation on the subject of marriage, is definitely sort of, you know, I definitely had female readers in mind when I was writing it. So I'm, I don't think the chick lit label's going to go away anytime soon. <laughs> um, but I don't know if, I don't know if there's such a thing as gender neutral writing, um, gender, neutral, gender neutral thinking, or um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really interested in questions that most of my female friends are really interested in right now. That's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Um, I might go back to writing about cowboys at some point in the future, but I don't really think so. <laughs> I'm not sure what the next thing will be, but um, this is where I am now. Uh, yeah, women have special work to do um, at this point in time. It's a really interesting moment in history to have decided to be a woman. <laughs> um, it's, you know, we have, uh, we're, I feel like any woman of our generation, and by our generation, I mean anybody who was born in the last 100 years, basically. Um, I think this era uh, of women have become sort of hamsters in a great, unprecedented social experiment, which is what happens if you give women a little bit of power? What happens if you give them autonomy? What happens if you give them control over their reproduction? What happens if you give them earnings? What happens if you give them options? You know, um, that social experiment has never been played out before. And so we're kind of, I really do feel like we're all sort of hamsters in this maze. It's this big sociological test that's going on. And all of us are sort of figuring out how to do it as we go, um, because we don't have centuries and centuries and millennia and millennia of role models for how you do this. Um, you know, uh, we don't have centuries of epics um, that are written about how you do this. You know, we don't have Odysseus. Um, we have, you know, Penelope, the big weaving and unweaving and weaving and unweaving scene <laughs> that just gets repeated and repeated and repeated that doesn't really it's not really relevant anymore to, to most of our lives. And so we're, we're all kind of charting our own mythologies as we go. And, and one of these great things that I heard once about this um, was Martha Beck said that, that she feels like she's met only four kinds of women in her life recently. And it's, it's women who, um, the, the first kind is, is women who decided to have a family instead of having a career and who feel conflicted about that choice. And then there are women who decided to have a career instead of having a family 
and who feel conflicted about that choice. And then there are the women who decided to have a family and a career who feel really, really conflicted about that choice. And then there are the mystics. Um, and that's the fourth sort of strange category. And she defines the mystics as a woman from any one of those other three categories who has somehow um, been able to kind of drown out or like drum out all the other distractions and all the other options and, ch and she's chosen her life, um, being guided by some sort of deeply honest interior voice. And she has made all sorts of peace with what she's doing, and that is who she is, and she is certain of it. And I would argue that any era that demands that people have to essentially become mystics in order to find peace and happiness is a really tough time in which to live because in other eras and other societies you didn't necessarily have to be a mystic in order to be a content person you know um, a path was laid out for you uh, that said this is what a good woman is you know um, and you went and you did those things and you did them well and you could rest at night you know, with a certain amount of peace, knowing that you were a good woman. Um, we don't have that consensus anymore uh, uh, about what constitutes a good woman, what constitutes a, a woman's life well led. Um, I think men, to a certain extent these days, are also struggling with these questions, but not nearly to the extent that women are. I mean, I remember being 18 years old in college and sitting up for hours and hours and weeks and weeks on end with my fellow 18-year-olds and trying to figure out what we were going to do in terms of when we were going to have kids and who was going to raise them and how are we going to have careers and what if we went to graduate school and what if we wanted to do, you know, and I got to say our 18-year-old male peers, I don't think they were over in the dorm room like next door having that conversation, you know, um, I think they maybe joined that conversation after their first kid was born when they were 36, you know, but I'm not sure they were worrying about that the whole time. Um, so it's hard, you know, um, and I'm not the first person to have said that, you know, um, but I think maybe again going back to why Eat, Pray, Love sort of struck a nerve with people, it's like I kind of inserted my own version of how to figure out that um, into people's conversations, but it's a conversation that's been going on for a really long time that is not nearly over. Mm -hmm.